What exactly are the stats behind loot drops in Breath of the Wild? A large portion of the game is centered around looting the world around you, and using those materials to drastically upgrade your experience. Whether that be through enhancing your armors, cooking your own meals and elixirs, crafting new weapons, or literally any other reason. Although a lot of these materials can be found laying in fixed locations around the world, most of the best ones are tied to enemies and objects that don't give consistent drops, but rather use a probability-based loot drop system that randomizes their drops each time, a fairly common system across open worlds and other games alike. However, since every enemy and object works off its own internal rules, figuring out the exact drops and probabilities for each would be nearly impossible. But thankfully, due to a data mine that I'll give full credits to in the description, all of this information has finally been revealed, and I thought I would do my best to break it down as thoroughly as possible, and provide any and all tips on farming these things out to get the best materials fastest. And yes, we will be covering the drop rate system for amiibos too, so stay tuned for that. But without further ado, here is how loot drops work in Breath of the Wild. The best way we can start this off is by diving deep into the loot drop system for one of the major enemies and compare it to the rest, which is the Guardian. According to the data, which is linked in the description, these guys drop a random amount of materials between exactly 10 and 12 upon death, no matter how you kill them, and each potential item has a certain probability to become a set part. The most common being Ancient Screws with 35%, Metal being an Ancient Shaft which has a 15% chance, and the least being the Giant Ancient Core which only has a 0.5% chance per part. This explains why on average, assuming you get an average of 11 parts, 3 to 4 of them will be a screw, 1 or 2 of them will be a shaft, and the rare Giant Ancient Core only drops after roughly 1 in 18 Guardian kills, or 5.5% of the time to be exact. Now notice this is all approximate, as given the randomness and the fact that there's no material cap, then any amounts can theoretically drop, as it's all in the odds. But considering the rarity and practicality of the cores, these are the ideal drops you can get from Guardian enemies, and the best type of Guardian to farm out for them would be the Stalkers. Not only do they drop the most Guardian parts compared to their companions like the Flying Ones, Decayed Ones, and Scouts, all of their legs can be cut off for additional materials before they die, which on average yields 9-ish extra base Guardian parts that don't take away from the drops of the Guardian's death. Now this system is pretty straightforward for some of the standalone enemies like this, and even basic animal drops for things like deer and bears, but most other enemies tend to work differently by pulling from multiple loot tables at once. Red Goblins pull from two different loot tables, Normal, which has a 100% chance of dropping a horn, and Normal 2, which has a 30% chance of dropping a fang, which explains why Red Goblins most of the time just drop a horn and only sometimes a fang with it. Blue Goblins also have the guaranteed horn drop, one or two chances at getting a fang, with an 80% chance of each, and they also get a third loot table for guts, with a 40% chance of getting them. And basically, the odds for getting more parts increases with color, up until you get to the silvers, which add two more loot tables for the gems, with the golds giving just slightly higher odds for the higher tier gems. This brings us to a total of five different loot tables an enemy like a Bokoblin can have, and if the odds are really in your favor, you can wind up getting some pretty good stuff. But easily enough, the other two main types of enemies, Lizelfos and Moblins, work off a nearly identical system, but they have slightly better chances to get more and better qualities of gems than their Bokoblin counterparts, considering that they are generally tougher. But the thing is, this only works for the standard types of enemies in the world, as a lot of the archer variants work off their own loot tables that give altar drops to accommodate their arrows. The guard archers, which are generally found on top of guard towers and consist of the red, green, and blue variants, have their own distinct loot categories that give them a high chance of dropping a stack of their base arrows, or a slightly lower chance of dropping their elemental arrows for those types, along with their monster parts. However, most other bow-wielding enemies in the game don't have special loot tables like the guards, which explains why a lot of them don't drop their arrows upon defeat, as they're just using the normal drop tables. The only two big exceptions are the Zoro's Domain Lizelfos, which all use a special drop table called Zora Special that make them drop their base arrows, and the other being the elemental wielding silver and gold enemies, which generally always drop a large quantity of the arrows they have in stacks of 10, which is a really great way to farm them out. 
but this still can't be beat by the arrow drop rates for Lynels, which can drop up to 40 of one type upon defeating a silver or gold variant, along with all their other high tier loot. Knowing all this, if there's a specific type of arrow you would like to farm out a lot of, you can always type in the name of the arrow into the Breath of the Wild object map link below, and all the enemies that will carry it will show up, which combined with the knowledge on drop rates, makes farming them a breeze. But putting aside enemies for a second, I did want to take a bit to talk about how drop rates work for some of the objects such as crates and ore deposits, as the drops for these work off a similar system as the enemies. The most sought after of the bunch are the three types of deposits, Normal, Rare, and Luminous, which all work off a single drop table for each. The Normals drop either one or two gems, usually either the Rock Salt, Flint, or Amber variety, but have a very small chance of going all the way up to Diamond. The Rares drop between two and five ores and have higher chances at the stronger gems, but don't include Rock Salt and Opals oddly enough. And finally, the Luminous Stones drop either one or two stones, with a very high chance of Luminous Ore mixed with a mini chance of Flint. Note that with these and the other types of objects, there is a small chance that you may break an ore and either nothing or less comes out than expected. But this is due to a glitch where the loot instantly falls through the map sometimes, and isn't counted in the loot drop calculation. Another sought after piece of info in regards to loot drops is with wood, because sometimes you can get really lucky and get multiple pieces to drop from a single log rather than just one. That's because these logs have two separate loot tables, one for a guaranteed piece of wood, and the second can drop either one or two pieces at a 20% chance for each. This means that the odds to get a total of three pieces of wood from a single tree is 2%, or 1 in 50 trees, which isn't too bad. But by far the most complex objects when it comes to loot drops are the crates and barrels, as sometimes these guys drop fruits, sometimes gems, sometimes arrows, or sometimes even something like a choo-choo. So how exactly do these guys work? Well, as we can see, these objects have separate drop tables for all these things, so the loot type inside isn't randomized like how most people think. If you're curious to see which containers have which drop tables, you can search the object on the object map, and the drop table it uses will be listed in the parameter section. You can also search the drop table name alongside the object to see all objects with specifically that loot table, which I find to be really awesome. Sorry, this object map is just such an amazing resource, and I highly recommend it to anyone who wants a better understanding of the world. But for now, I want to get into the last few important things in terms of loot drops and what you should know in this game. So from the loot table data I've been taking a lot of this information from, there is a ton more info here that I'm not going to run down one by one for this video. But if you're going to look over it by yourself, there is a few details that I do want to point out. One, some of these objects and tables are written in the game's code, but are never used. One of the most notable additions found here being the Beemos, which are a classic Zelda enemy that never managed to make their way into the full version of this game. Also, most objects and animals have separate drop tables when destroyed with either fire or ice, which is responsible for dropping the roasted or frozen varieties of their normal drops. But other than that, there are some really cool things to break down by going over some of the minuscule things about these enemies. Stone Taluses, for an example, drop nearly a dozen ores upon death with their loot table, but most importantly, they have a really unique secondary drop table called Milestone, which dictates the ore types that come out while actively attacking the boss. How this works is that every time a Talus gets a quarter of their health trimmed off, they drop one of these ores from the milestone list, meaning that every Talus will drop three from this table before dying and dropping the rest. Another really helpful stat to know is the drop rate for star fragments when defeating Lynels in the game. These ingredients are super useful for upgrading a lot of the classic armors, but getting them from the night sky is both random and tedious. However, for Silver Lynels, they can drop either 2 or 3 of them at a 5% chance of each, which averages to 1 Star Fragment every 8 Lynels, and for Gold, their loot tables allows them to drop either 2 or 3 at a 10% chance of each, which averages to 1 in every 4 Lynel kills. So it's definitely a great method if you also want to get great ores and Lynel weapons simultaneously. Beyond this though, there is only one more thing to go over for this video, and that is the drop rates for Amiibos. As we know, scanning in a Zelda amiibo will give you a bunch of assorted goodies and a chest, but there are actually a lot of different drop tables and rules that go into play for each, considering that every amiibo has their own unique drop tables. 
For the loose loot, each amiibo always pulls from its respective normal list, which contains an assorted variety of weak goodies. But 20% of the time, it will also pull from the small hit list, which drops a few stronger items in as well. So pretty simple for this. But for the chest loot, it's a bit more complex, as 80% of the time, it'll pull from the big hit list, which contains lower value drops, and 20% of the time, it'll pull from the Great Hit list, which generally contains all of your cool exclusive gear we've known to love, like the Twilight Bow, Big Oran Sword, or even the Specialty Tunics. But considering that the chance of getting something like the exclusive weapons is 10% on top of the 20% chance of getting a Great Hit item, that makes most of the rare amiibos in this game have an average drop rate of 2%, which is pretty hard to rely off of. However, there is a hidden rule in play, where if the last 4 times you scanned an amiibo and saved your game resulted in a big hit item, your next one is guaranteed to be a great hit item. This can be used to your advantage for save scumming amiibos to get the best drops, as the 2% odds of getting the rare items will be boosted to 10%. The only thing to keep in mind is that the drops are only at their best state after you clear your first Divine Beast, as getting most of the cool exclusive loot is nearly impossible beforehand. This is why both the big and great hit list have 3 entries for each amiibo. Because the normal tables are what's pulled from if you scan when the rune is first unlocked, the parasol table is what's pulled from if you scan after you get the paraglider, and the final remain table is the one with all the good loot that's unlocked after you clear your first divine beast. If you want to see all this info put into a more practical setting, I've recently posted the platform's first amiibo-only run of this game, that uses all the information on amiibo drops to beat Breath of the Wild without picking up any other item. So I highly recommend giving it a watch if that type of content suits you, as it was a lot of fun to put together. But anyways, that is all for the information I have in this video, so thank you all so much to everyone for watching! This concludes part 11 in our Stats of the Wild series, but there will be plenty more to come within the following months, or even years to Breath of the Wild 2's release. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe here if you haven't already for all future content to come. Also, thank you so much to my amazing patrons and YouTube members who help support the channel. If you would like to help me out here for as little as a dollar a month, all the info can be found in the description below. Anyways, thank you all so so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.